Okay, I'll try. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I've got about three hours of material to get through in 25 minutes, um, but I couldn't resist this. I got home at about one o'clock yesterday morning. I had to make this. Um, it might be a piece of newsworthy information that may even eclipse the Hicks. Um, at half time, I was predicting 15 plus or minus two goal difference, but uh, let this be a lesson to young analysts out there of the danger of extrapolation. Um, anyway, it's. Um, Here we go. Now I understand. I got the answer. Okay, so uh, when I was asked to give this talk, I looked in my calendar and I couldn't find an excuse not to come, and so I immediately said yes, but then I immediately regretted it. It's very hard to give these kind of talks. You're always going to upset somebody that you didn't include their project. Um, I went back and took a look at what has been done in the past by some esteemed colleagues of mine who are very good at this kind of thing. Um, they talk about things like summarize at cutting edge R&D. They talk about the challenges of HEP. They talk about the long incubation times, uh, the stress for early R&D, the stress for global. We've heard of the word global a lot uh, the last couple of days. Uh, and then they all start with a Livingston plot. So uh, with that in mind, I thought, uh, OK, I'll go and get a Livingston plot. It's amazing what you can find on Google. Uh, eventually found this one, uh, picked this one, because I could edit it and stretch it out a little bit to the right. Um, so here is basically uh, the, what we know and love. And it really shows 60 years of uh, phenomenal success of accelerator-based uh, high-energy physics. There's uh, no doubt about that. And I've put on what we know, uh, LHC and uh, Super KKB, just a, just a little bit in the future. This is, this is where we are today. Of course, LHC running is going to go on into the future. And we know also now that we will have an upgrade, um, uh, which will take us to unprecedented levels of, uh, of interfentobinds. Um, but beyond this picture, there is really nothing. Nothing in the sense of anything we know for sure. All we have is plans, dreams, aspirations, and hopes. And it's actually about the plans, dreams, and aspirations, hopes that I shall talk about in the remainder of this talk. So what are they? Well, we have two variants of Illinear colliders, uh, the ILC and CLIC. Here I've showed them in kind of, sort of staged, staged form. Notice these uh, fuzzy bars are not running, but they are uh, first physics, and we really don't know very accurately when that will be. Um, we go beyond that, of course. We have uh, E plus E minus storage rings that are being discussed. Uh, beyond that, we have 100 TV proton-proton colliders. Um, that's really what I'm going to be talking about in this talk. Now, the problem is that the tendency is that way. So we all know the Livingston plot is saturating. And why do these things drift off? Why do we continue to make these charts predict the future, only to find five years later that everything just shunted to the right? Well, the reason is, of course, that we get ever more ambitious. The costs become higher and higher. We need longer in R&D times, and not last least, but the politics and the opportunities for building these machines become smaller. This is one reason why we always talk about the need to go to global projects. What we do in the accelerator world, driven by you people, I should say, is we push the envelope continuously. We're looking always to go to higher energies, because you tell us that's where we should go. And you're always telling us to turn up the luminosity. In fact, you basically tell us to turn up everything, except, of course, the detector backgrounds. They're supposed to be zero. Um, both these things drive then scope and technology to their limits. And that's what we're really good at. And that's what challenges us. And that's what makes us enjoy doing what we do. But I could change these axes. And I could say that the energy tends to drive uh, the dollars. Right? To get to the high energies, pushes uh, high field magnets and high gradient RF, both of these things are cost drivers for these very big, ambitious machines. And at least for leptons, the luminosity, which also has to go up, um, drives the megawatts. And in fact, up to now, we haven't really bothered too much about megawatts, but now we're getting very green, and we have to worry about things like carbon footprints uh, and the cost of electricity in general. And so I would say now megawatts is something we can't really ignore very much anymore. It's a kind of a new currency. So we have to talk about that too. So really, it's all about cost per GeV or inverse Fentobahn. That's what it's all about. The future requires paradigm shifts so that we don't, if we just take what we know and extrapolate it to where we want to be, we just can't possibly afford it. So we have to get clever. We have to find new technologies. We have to find new ways. We have, in order to fix, uh, when we do that, of course, we then push the risk. There's an enormous risk in these clever ideas. And we have to do early mitigating R&D to fix that. 
And last but not least, we have to position ourselves in such a way with that R&D that we are ready to take and exploit opportunities, political and financial, uh, when they arrive. So that's kind of the context for the rest of the talk. So what does my view of the road ahead look like? Well, of course, we have LHC. And we're very happy to have LHC for the next 20 years, and that's a great thing. We know this very well, so I don't have to dwell on it. Uh, the next thing uh, in the LHC running, once we've been running at uh, the, the high energy, is, is, uh, is uh, the high energy upgrade. But this in itself is a, quite an extensive project. And this in itself is risk, which has to do R&D, mostly in the form of the high-field magnets and the crab cavities. The high-field magnets, to go to where we want to go for this, of course, requires a paradigm shift. Up to now, we've always built them with niobium titanium. Now we have to build them with a new material, niobium-3 tin. Uh, the good news is that's going on quite well, and we have prototypes, so we all think that's possible. But none of these magnets have ever seen the living day inside an accelerator environment, and there are still many questions about how that will work. So again, early R&D, and of course the R&D is being done, and I think everybody's relatively confident this will happen. Beyond that, of course, the next thing on the list at least I believe, could be the ILC in Japan, starting around about Physics 2028. This has now been going for many, time, for many years, and uh, this is a project that's very close to my own heart, of course. Uh, we've got 20 years of worldwide R&D behind this now, and it's been a truly global effort. Now, we use this word a lot. Uh, many people use it. Many lab directors use the word global. But the linear collider really, really, really is global. Uh, it was, it was being developed in the last 10 years as a truly global collaboration uh, of equal partnerships of 130 institutes with no real central driving lab, no real central driving team. And in fact, that in itself was an experiment. And we showed that we could do it. The physics and detector community are very good at doing this. But I have to say my accelerated colleagues are not. But we showed it's possible. Uh, we know the cost, 7.8 billion, cheap at half the price. Scope is 200 to 500, extensible up to a TV. Of course, that's the strength of a linear collider. The primary cost driver, of course, is the SRF technology. 17,000, 1.3 gigahertz cavities, 1,800 cryomodules, about the same as LHC. But we have them, and we're building lots of them. This is a mature technology. We have a global test facilities around the world that have, have contributed to the, test, uh, to the ILC TDR. Uh, Flash at DAISY, STF at, at KEK. Caesar TA for the, for the damping rings, uh, uh, particularly for the electron crowd work. Uh, Daphne did work on kickers. Uh, last but not least here, I'd like to mention ATF2 for the final focus systems. As you know, in linear colliders, we have to focus very small beams. ATF has been unprecedented in, in its endeavor to show that that's possible and understand how you tune these tiny nano beams and keep them stable and reproducibly tune them. They've just achieved 44 nanometers. That's very, very close to the goal where they want to go. Uh, I think that's been a great success. Um, in terms of cryomodule production, and when I talk about being mature, it's really the XFEL in Europe that's really made it mature. Uh, this is fantastic. Uh, we, this is a, basically a prototype for an ILC Linux at about a 5% level. Um, if, if the uh, solid state and the structural biologists and the, and the light source community weren't paying for this, billion dollar project, we would have to build it ourselves because this is a real prototype of our LINAC. And it's driven the development along with ILC. The ILC, of course, has driven the gradient. Um, and together with the mass production now of XFEL in Europe and soon the mass production of cryomodules based on ILC technology for the, for the new life source in America, ILC LS2, this will put us in a very beautiful window of opportunity towards the end of the century. We will have enough expertise, enough infrastructure, in principle, enough industrial capacity to build these cryomodules. And I can just give you a glimpse of how we're doing at XFEL. We're about halfway through the production of the cavities, and this is the statistics of the cavity gradients that are coming out of this entirely industrial process. It's never been done before. Uh, these cavities arrive in a box ready to be cooled down and tested. And the, blue dash, uh, the red dash lines is the ILC requirements, and you can see we're sitting at about an average of about 33, 34 megavolts per meter. This technology, as it stands right here, is good enough for ILC. And then, of course, we must look east and understand the political context and understand that the, the Japanese government has made a very clear statement, I believe, that they are interested in hosting the ILC 
as a global international project. Uh, and of course, on top of that, we have both very strong support from the P5 report in all three scenarios and clear indication from the, from the EU in the, in the strategy document expressing interest to participate in this. This, together with the technology I just discussed, is a window of opportunity. And the question is, are we ready to make use of this window of opportunity? If you go to uh, Kitakami, they will welcome you. There's many things like that in the town. Right. But ILC is not alone on this time part in the road, because now we have our colleagues from IHEP who are proposing to build a storage ring. This, uh, this machine is going to propose to be an extension of the BEPC, which would be typically about a 50-kilometer ring. It's still in its infancy. They're still discussing the parameters, of course. Um, the idea, of course, is uh, very similar to FCC, who I'll talk about in, uh, next. Um, to build a 50-kilometer E plus E minus storage ring to do Higgs physics at 240 GeV. And then at some latest time, you pull out the electron machine and you put in a proton machine to go up to several tens of TeV. Um, this is interesting because if, if, uh, if we understand correctly, this is a window of opportunity also here on the same time scale as the ILC in Japan. So it's possible, it's just possible, we might have both these things. I'm not sure that's true, but, but it's possible. Um, I won't say any more in particular about this, but until I get to FCC, because then I want to talk about the technologies, and of course there's overlap. So if we look now even further down the road, to zoom in a little bit, what comes next? And at this stage, we're really discussing what's going to happen after LHC. And a lot of things get a little confusing. All right, so we have possibility of high energy LHC, that's just basically putting 20 Tesla magnets in the existing tunnel. We have this FCC study, which is basically being driven by the, by the, to see if there's a possibility of having a 100 TV proton collider and the possibility of having uh, an E plus E minus storage rig in there as an intermediate step. And not last, but certainly not least, there's also click. So what does this look like? Um, up to 33 TeV if you can make 20 Tesla dipoles. This requires high temperature superconductors. And it looks like we put everything together, you could get something like 2 times 10 to the 34. Click, of course, is a linear collider. Uh, but it's been designed from 500 up to 3 TeV. In fact, really, the whole rationale behind Click was multi-TeV, as we will see. And it's based on warm expand accelerating structures and a very novel scheme called two-beam acceleration. We keep saying novel scheme, although it's now 25 years old. And there, the luminosity could be up to about 2.6 to 34. And the new boy on the block, of course, as of, as of this year, really, is this FCC study. And again, it's been driven by, by, uh, by the proton machines. Uh, possibility of 16 Tesla dipoles if we stick with no even 310. Uh, but of course, everybody, you know, the holy grail is to go up to 20 Tesla and high temperature superconductors. Um, again, a real, just a study. It's been emphasized, a study, a feasibility study, ultimately with a cost. The idea, of course, is to, uh, is to have something ready by 2018 for the next European strategy. And again, the studies really push this idea of being global context. There's just a picture of what that ring might look in the Geneva Basin. Um, yeah, that fits. This is not a new idea, of course, uh, just to give some uh, old work some, some, some praise. Uh, the American colleagues looked at this back in 1998 for the LHC, and the website, in fact, is still there, and their report is still there, and they actually set the way and set the path for this. Uh, they did a lot of the groundwork, so actually there's much to pick up for this new study to work with. Right, so let's talk about PP colliders and the technology and the, and the paradigm shift. The paradigm shift here, of course, to get to these very high uh, Tesla per meter magnets is to shift the materials. Now, we've talked about Nobium 310, uh, and, and that's already a lot of work going on, as you should see, for the, for the, for the high Lumi upgrade. But to get up to uh, 16 or 20 Tesla magnets, we really start talking about high temperature superconductors. And this is real, real, real cutting edge, state of the art R&D. Basically, you know, magnets don't exist. Materials don't exist, actually, in any shape or form that we might consider using. Nonetheless, uh, good friends of mine sit around the table and they think, well, in principle, 20 Tesla should be feasible. But there's an understanding there that feasible and realizable and then practicable and then affordable can have several decades, right? So, so this is always bearing in mind. We always set the goalpost high um, because that's where we really want to go and it drives the R&D. Um, but the reality of what you build and accelerate in the day has many other factors. 
Uh, it's a busy slide, but I'll just pick out the high points. It's really just to highlight the materials that are being discussed. Now, Obium 310, of course, a few years ago, and Obium 310 was the thing, oh, yes, this is where we want to go. And now, in fact, it's almost a commodity, as, as Lucio pointed out, uh, mostly because ITER, ITER wanted it. It needs about 500 tons of this material. Uh, as we've seen, uh, for the high, for high lumini, uh, uh, sorry, for the high lumi uh, LHC uh, work at uh, Fermilab under LARP, uh, such magnets have been achieved. Um, so this all looks very good. Again, just a caveat that none of these magnets have seen beam. There's, there's many questions about how they will react in an accelerator environment. The problem is, again, cost. Um, for the Lumi upgrade, of course, you know, about 50 tons, it's a, it's a few magnets. It's probably not the cost driver, but for a real new machine, uh, and here are some numbers at the bottom here, uh, and this is for, for high-energy LHC, I believe. It's not for the big ring. It's for the 27-kilometer version. We need 1,000 tons of niobium titanium and 3,000 tons of niobium 310 and 750 tons of HTS, which doesn't really exist yet. Um, so barely you need a lot of work when you see that these, the cost of these uh, materials is phenomenally high. Um, and there's a long way to go. So the, you know, the, the line here is you can build uh, a magnet maybe at 16 tesla, um, but can, can you build it cheaply? And just to really iterate that, this is a log plot. This is, this is a US dollars per, per kiloamp meter. Uh, and you can see niobium tin there in the middle at one, uh, roughly. And you can see all these other things that people are discussing are, are, you know, are several uh, factors of five, 10, even that factor up 100 more expensive uh, than what we know today. So you have to do technology development to make this work. You first need the superconductor, then you have to figure out how to build the magnet. And then once you have a magnet, you just might not be able to afford to make 3,000 of them. You have to figure out how to make it cheap. It's a long road to these machines. Um, I just picked up one, one slide quickly about uh, the other challenges of the hadron machines uh, from, from uh, Mikhail Benedict from the, from the kickoff meeting FCC. He put, the first three major bullet points here are called bread and butter. Accelerated physics, of course, these machines push everything to the limit. It's always, you know, there's never any margin or safety risk factor in a high energy machine. You know, and one man's safety margin is another man's luminosity upgrade. Uh, we always push these things to the limits. Um, but the critical points here, which are special, and is, of course, is the store beam energy at eight gigajoules per beam. This is something to have a little bit of respect for, of course. And, of course, something that we don't really normally worry about too much with proton machines is the very high level of synchrotron radiation, 26 watts per, per meter per aperture. Um, this is something, again, with a superconducting uh, magnet machine that you have to pay very, very, very careful attention to. And I add my little thing here, of course, is cost. At the end of the day, if this ring is just ludicrously too expensive, then clearly it's not a real option. I would point you at a review talk from the, uh, from the parallel session. I thought this is extremely good. I didn't have time to pull out the details. Uh, please go here. It really shows that there's a lot of good work already going on for this study, although it's in its infancy. And what they're doing really is pointing out all these issues and problems and starting to think about how to address them. And this is always how you start. Uh, moving on to Click. As I said, Click is actually, by comparison, quite mature. Um, the tech, this obviously, it's been a lot of R&D for the last 25 years, mostly centered around CTF3, which I'll mention briefly. Um, this is a picture of the, of the Click linear collider, and it's a bit complicated. But if you look at the bottom half of this picture, that's actually the linear collider. And the bit at the top is the moral equivalent of the klystron, because it uses this two-beam acceleration scheme. Basically, you accelerate a, uh, an electron beam up uh, with a current of 4.2 amps, and then you compress it by some combiner magic to give you a peak current of 100 amps. So it's like a transformer. And then you use this 100 amp beam, you decelerate it in one structure, transfer the microwave energy over to the accelerator and accelerate the other beam. This is the only way. Originally, this was the only way you could see to get high peak megawatt level pulsed RF for 30 gigahertz, which was click the original schedule. Since they've come down to 12, of course, uh, in principle, you could use klystrons, but this is still considered to be more efficient. Uh, it's a very ambitious machine and a lot of work has been going on. This is like a typical size of, of, a, of a click module. Um, on the right side is the accelerating beam with all this copper waveguide you see, the X-band waveguide, and the right side is the drive beam. The rest of this is uh, obviously water cooling, diagnostics, and look, that big black thing underneath is the vibration suppressor systems, uh, which each of these things need. And I think, I'm not sure, but I think you need about 3,000 of these modules. So again, it's a question of cost. Um, much progress has been made. There's already a CDR published in 2012, which really really barely ticks off most of the conceptual uh, showstoppers and says, yes, everything is feasible. Uh, what's really missing, of course, 
is some sort of integrated systems tester. Nobody's really built a Linux uh, using this scheme and really accelerated it. There's a lot of tests of individual components, but ideally you would like to put them together. This is, uh, and such a test facility, exactly like XFEL did for ILC, such a test facility would cost quite a lot of money. And so that's a problem. Um, the um, high gradient structures have already achieved um, the goals, but, uh, but they, again, the, um, the statistics is relatively low. But this is currently the only option to multi-TV E plus E minus. Looking down the road, oh, sure, if I say that, of course, at this time scale, going back to the, the, the IHEP proposal, of course, this would be about also the same time scale where they would take out the E plus E minus machine and put in uh, a proton machine in the ring. Now let's just talk about Higgs and beyond and talk about these E plus E storage rings. LEP, of course, when it was built, uh, was said to be the last E plus E minus storage ring. Of course, now it seems that's not the case anymore. Uh, we have, of course, this EPC from Beijing machine and 100 watt megawatts of uh, total beam power, um, 70 million amps beam arrays, 240 GB, 50 kilometers, with about a luminosity of about 2, 10 to the 34 per IP. Um, and they're saying possibly ready 2028. Now, as part of the FCC study, um, there's also this study of maybe putting in an E plus E my machine in this 100 kilometer tunnel. And there they're looking at an energy range from 90 to 350. Uh, the parameters are roughly the same. Again, the power is the same, 100 megawatts. It's a somewhat arbitrary number, but everybody seems to think that's a good number to shoot for. Um, currents range there from about 1.4 amps up to 7 milliamps. Um, this thing would probably could or be ready around about 2035 post LHC. Um, just to talk a little bit about storage performance, uh, because there's been a lot of discussion about the very high luminosities you can get at these machines, and in principle you can. Um, this is just a plot here to show how, how the luminosity uh, changes as you, as you go uh, either down or up, depending on which you look at it. Um, because, of course, everybody knows synchron radiation goes to the fourth power over R, of e to fourth power of E over R, uh, you can use that uh, as you go down in energy. Uh, you can use that available RF power to increase the current uh, almost quadratically. Um, the, in a storage ring, of course, you're really fixed a lot by the beam-beam interaction and what that does for you. And there's a scaling law here. It really goes, a fixed power luminosity really goes as 1 over E to the 1.8 if you take the LEP scaling. Um, I put everything on here, including various upgrade options for ILC. You can see really the storage ring, uh, the least the one that's been proposed in the 100 kilometer ring, is uh, in terms of performance, luminosity performance is really pretty hard to beat. Um, the CEPC machine from Beijing is a little bit more, uh, shall we say, a little, little less aggressive in its parameters. But there's many challenges with this. Now, we don't want to give the impression that this is just a straightforward, simple extrapolation to LEP. This is not true. You don't get two to three orders of magnitude of luminosity uh, for nothing. Dealing with the high powers, we've discussed high power S systems, 11 gigavolts or 20 megavolts per meter, beam polarization, top-up injection is required. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. All these things have been identified. I'd have to say that probably in terms of R&D, it's more D than R. But nonetheless, there's several possibility off-ramps there where you would maybe have to tone down uh, some of these claims of luminosity. Last but not least, of course, again comes cost and megawatts. And megawatts is an important number, as I said, you can't ignore them. Um, LHC, of course, I think is something under 100 megawatts. It's difficult to actually dig out the number that's just the machine, but of that order. And everything we're discussing here goes above that. Um, ILC starts at about 100. For TV, it goes up to 300 megawatts. Are these machines the uh, very high luminosity machines? Of course, that doesn't come for free. They're up 200 to 300 megawatts. Uh, and we have to pay care of that, and we have to consider the megawatts. So storage ring or a linear collider. Why are we even talking about linear collider if the storage ring's too so good? Well, that's because it was always known that sooner or later you would cross this line. Um, it's undeniable that you cross that line. The question today is exactly where you do it and what you gain. Um, 250 GV, I would say, favors a storage ring. I think if you would ask me today, I only want to build a 240 GV machine. That's all I'm interested in. I'd say, hey, build a storage ring. If you want to go up above that and beyond, you have to build a linear collider. Um, ultimately, of course, this is your decision at some level. Physics, the cost of the machines, and the political opportunity must decide. But I do believe that the ultimate future of E plus and minus colliders is linear, or not at all. 
right? And if we don't do it now, probably in 20, 30 years, we'll be talking about it again. I have to speed up here because I've only got a minute left. Next thing on the list is muon colliders. Muon colliders make claims to go to very high luminosities in very small footprints. Um, we all know there's no beam strolling, so they give superb energy resolution. There's no synchrotron radiation, um, which means there's no damping, which is the bad side. And it's a possibility for cost of megawatts, so it's always better, faster, cheaper. Of course, the trouble is, muons have a tendency to decay. Uh, and the challenges are just too many to list. Um, two bits of magic here. One is the fast, rapid acceleration that you have to do to make them so realistic that they at least survive long enough to make um, luminosity. They get about 1,000 turns in the collider ring. Uh, and that brings many, many challenges. And the other piece of magic is the cooling, which we have to use this ionized channel cooling. None of this has really been done before. Uh, lots of L&D is required. But, of course, most of this has been focused in Fermilab. Uh, it is attractive because it does fit onto a compact site. It's extendable. You can stage it. Of course, there's a whole history of neutrino factories behind this thing as a natural step to a muon collider. I have to admit, uh, coming out of the closet, I'm a little bit like, I'm a little bit um, uh, a muon collider fan. Um, many, 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 many. I wanted to mention mice. Mice is a proposal, that, uh, a thing that will actually hopefully come to fruition very soon and prove and demonstrate the, uh, the ionized cooling. And there's supposed to be a feasible statement by the end of the decade, but on this slide it didn't tell me which decade that was, but I assume it's this one. Right. Last thing on my road. Can you see that? Let me help you. Plasma wave field acceleration. Now we're really going to dream. Um, laser driven or E plus E minus driven. Laser driven light sources for sure. Um, there's an awful amount of work now going in PWA everywhere. Uh, this is fundamental blue skies research, right? So we're way away from really talking about anything serious, but there's an awful lot of effort to be going into this, particularly at DAISY. Uh, CERN, of course, Awake, FACET, and FACET2 at Slack and Flash Forward at DAISY are all looking at particle driven wake field acceleration as a possibility to a future HEP machine. And as even those people are bold enough to dream about what it might look like, I picked this up from IPAC, from Jean Pierre et al. at Slack. This looks like click on steroids. Um, but it's an interesting paper because it really shows you put the numbers together. If everything works, it's quite, the numbers hold together and you can control the megawatts because it's really about efficiencies. It's really about controlling that beam quality. And they all point out, of course, that it's actually quite a natural extension to something like the ILC. You could start ripping out superconducting cavities and putting in plasma weight field channels. That's down the fish of the road, but I just wanted to point out to the obvious, of course, is that HEP has often done and pushed this technology as we've just been discussing uh, beyond the state of the art. If we take high gradient SRF, it's something I know about, high energy physics has pushed the cost of this down by over, over magnitude, order of magnitude, has made it affordable for everybody. And now high, uh, SRF Linux are absolutely everywhere. But there's a new frontier. Many other fields of science, light sources, uh, it just goes on. Uh, I can't list it anymore. I'm running out of time. But the point is, there's a great deal of good uh, state-of-the-art technology work going on but outside of HTTP. It's no longer HTTP-driven. And we must make use of this and make use of this synergy. XFEL is just one example I've mentioned. It's an absolutely fantastic time to be an accelerator physicist and all of it's HTTP. Right, I think I'm done with this. I think I covered everything. Um, I didn't talk about any of this. I apologize for that. There are, of course, other things that weren't within the scope of this talk. But the real question is, what will this look like in five years' time? And the worst thing that could possibly happen is for me or somebody like me to come back five years' time and show you exactly this picture. Uh, it might happen. I don't think it will happen, but it could. But we'd like to see it change. At least it shows something's happening. The real challenge is getting the money. All right? There's no doubt about that. But we know our science is compelling. And, of course, by science, I mean accelerator science. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Nick, for covering a hell of a lot of work there. Questions for Nick? No questions about the football. <laughs> no? Well, let's, uh, let's thank him for a very comprehensive coverage.